Hey everybody, welcome to the video. I told you, I told you I was going to do one, and I was going to do one right behind the other one, and bammo, here it is. Um, two in one day, and they say crack is a bad thing. Anyways, hi guys, welcome to the video. Uh, please subscribe if you, I got told I, I touched my face too much, and it's true. I, I try to touch my face all the freaking time and I'm scratching and all of that. You might think I am on crack actually. So you know just get this out of the way. Oh okay, good. All right. I'm gonna try really hard not to touch my face. I'm gonna try. No promises. Uh please subscribe <laughs> after that after that bout of professionalism, please subscribe to the video channel and uh click on the little bell if uh, you want to be kept updated on when I have new videos coming out. Subscribing to the channel helps me claw my way up to a thousand subscribers or a thousand plus. And at that point, I'm pretty sure I get to start making money off these things. And you know, couldn't, couldn't hurt. A little, little money wouldn't be a bad thing. And I have a granddaughter to start <laughs> preparing for college. The doctors this week, um, granddaughter had been uh, acting kind of fussy. Um, and uh, the kid's grandmother, Emily's grandmother, uh, and I actually, when I heard the description of what was going on, thought it might be colic because the little baby was having trouble pooping without some help. And uh, Emily would sit there and hold her little legs and like, you know, <laughs> basically like pump her little legs for her. But um, basically, we thought it might be colic. It was not colic. It turns out uh, that what the doctor who talked to her this past week said was, hey, your daughter's bored. She's really, really bored. And uh, you need to do something about that. So, um, you know, basically I'm like, aha, read to her more. Read to her all the time. So, uh, my my little granddaughter is definitely going to college and if you guys just click on that button to subscribe it it means maybe someday that um i'll i'll make a little scratch off of off of rambling like a lunatic on here so please please consider subscribing if you haven't already if you have already thank you you're the best um you can also share the videos because that helps me a lot too <laughs> though you show them one like this one they'll be like why, why the hell are you watching this guy um this is kind of a nice way of kind of wrapping up the videos we've been doing on edit editing because these are basically some stories i've have uh from my own experiences dealing with editors and when i started out i was a stringer i was a freelance writer i guess i still am i did a story last year or earlier this year i think on uh for a magazine so uh, as a freelance writer, you are pretty much commissioned by a editor. They go, hey, you, do you want to do a story on the city council meeting Thursday night? And you say, boy, do I? And, you know, they say no more than 500 words. Let me know what happened. Uh, pay particular attention to this, this thing that was going on because that might be you know, kind of controversial and it might be news. So you jump on the pole and slide down the pole and then you have your little press credential on you and you jump into your POS to Toyota and actually no that's that's not that's not right best cars I ever had were Toyotas I used to have a little pickup truck when my son was little that was an old Toyota grounds car grounds truck for Radford University I loved that truck it was the best freaking vehicle I ever had in my life and then I was saying like a Toyota Corolla that did very, that served very well. It, it died in service to our family. <laughs> so uh, anyway, you, you drive to the meeting, you, you report, and then you turn it over to your editor and you're kind of done at that point because your editor is the one who's going to move things around, delete things, change things. And of course you're gonna get a look at it before it goes to the press and you can fight or argue with your editor on something if you want to. I was very fortunate. Most of the editors I've worked with, I really haven't had any kind of conflict or controversy with. Um, and that comes, I'll explain a little bit of that to you later. But, but basically, you know, the editor's paid to make your story look better and sound better. Uh, it, nine times out of 10, there is no ego involved with an editor. But that 
tenth time. Ooh. Ooh, let me tell you. Um, so uh, their, their job is to make you look better. <laughs> their job is to make you look like a better writer than perhaps you actually are. Um, and it is a cooperative process. As I, as I kind of moved along in my career, um, I went from being a, just a stringer to getting to be an editor on several publications and um, getting to have more say in the editorial content and working with people who were working for me as stringers um, and giving them feedback on their work. So I've been on both sides of it. And like I said, most of my experiences have been wonderful, great collaborations and very happy for those. Um, I did have one issue at a newspaper. I was, I was editor of one of a newspaper that was in a string of uh, community newspapers. And uh, there had been a murder many, many years ago, like decades ago in my jurisdiction. And I was uh, invited to the execution of this guy. And I felt like as the editor and the reporter, all in one for the paper, that I needed to, to go to that and uh, hear his last words and report that to the community. That's the whole reason Department of Corrections reaches out to the community uh, publications. So I went and I did it and I met the, vic the victim's sister. It was a whole family that got wiped out by this guy. And he went to his grave proclaiming that he was innocent. So it was a very controversial kind of a, it's a controversial story. We wrote numerous articles on it leading up to the execution and they sold remarkably well because it was like everybody in this community in this town had a, had an opinion on, was he guilty? Was he not guilty? Was it a conspiracy? It's I've actually thought about writing a book about this because it is very complex and very fascinating. And it is one of those crimes that affected the whole community. It was the first murder in this town in, in decades. And it really shocked everybody. And, and it had such bizarre twists and turns to it. Um, but basically I met uh, the, the, the victims, one of the victims sister and her daughter. And she had not talked to the press since the trial, which had turned into kind of a media zoo. And uh, she agreed to sit down with me um, the next day before I left town and give an interview. And one of the things that she said, you know, she kind of broke down at one point and she was like, you know, I keep seeing this guy who killed my sister and, and my, my nieces and, you know, my, her husband on the front page of your paper. And it was true. We, we end up sticking, basically I would lay stuff out. I break the stories and put the photos together and lay stuff out. And then this guy who really wasn't an editor, but his daddy was one of the guys who owned the newspaper. Uh, he was a graphic artist who thought he was a publisher. And um, he kept slapping the mug shot of this guy in with the photos that I was doing. So he had been on the page of the paper for like four weeks. And I told her, I said, I, I promise you, this story is going to be about your family. It's going to be about the people he killed, his victims. It's not going to be about him. He's not going to be on the cover. And that was the promise I made. So I lay out the paper and I'd stay up all night, like Tuesday night, I think it was Tuesday night, laying the paper out. And then it was either Tuesday or Wednesday, but it would come out like the next day. It would go to press. So there's my story about the family. There's my picture of the family. There's my picture of, of the extended family. All of these are victims. My whole story is about the victims. And Mr. Publisher wannabe had slammed this big fucking picture of the murderer right there on the page next to the family, next to the victims. And I was like, we, we need to take that off. And he's like, no, no, that's, we need that. That's important for the story. And I'm like, no, we, we don't need it. We've had him on there for like four weeks. He, I, I made a promise. We need to take that off. And he refused to do it. And he ran to daddy and daddy was the publisher and the publisher was a solid guy he was no he was all about business and doing business effectively and efficiently he didn't play favorites he didn't make value judgments as far as i could tell the man had no bias i think he was an android but we're sitting in his office both of me and the other guy are screaming at each other 
classy. And um, he just shuts it down. And he's like, okay, first of all, this layout looks like shit. Second, <laughs> second of all, um, what did you say exactly? Why do you want this picture off here? And I said, because I promised this woman that she'd never have to look at this guy's face on the paper again. And I promised her that this story was just gonna be about her family who was slaughtered by this guy. We've given him plenty of press. We've given him coverage before the execution. We've covered the execution. This needs to be about the victims. This is like the closure, the closure for the whole series we've been doing. And he's like, all right, take it off. And that was at that point, my time there was somewhat limited. <laughs> I walked out of the room and there's this guy in a robe with a sickle and a raven on his shoulder. And I was like, okay, uh, time to get that resume uh, prepped. Um, but the last thing that the publisher said to me is, is, as you know, you shouldn't have made that promise to her. And I said, she didn't want to talk to anyone. She didn't want to talk to the press because of the way the press treated her. So I didn't give her a promise and I got an exclusive story from her. But even if that, that aside, what she asked for was, was human. It wasn't, it wasn't a ridiculous request. And I don't feel in any way, shape or form that it was wrong for me to give her that promise. And he said, well, you don't want to do that because you're limiting your options for publication and blah, 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 blah. And, um, and while I have a great deal of respect for this fella, this publisher, and I hope he is well, hale and hearty and healthy. Uh, I'm pretty sure that his date of death, he had already planned out and uh, had it scheduled in. Uh, but I don't think he's, I think he's probably still among the living. I hope he is. Um, I had a great deal of respect for him as a publisher. I had a great deal of respect for him as someone who was like efficient and organized. Um, I do not agree with him on that assessment. You have to, you'll get, you'll get to a place sometime if you, if you write enough or you write for enough people where you have to make a judgment for yourself. And sometimes that judgment may go counter to what your editors, your publisher are saying. And then you have to take the consequences of that, which may be your work doesn't get published. It may mean you lose your job. So those are things to keep in mind. Like I said, that's the one out of 10. Nine times out of 10, working with an editor is a pleasure. The guy that I worked with at Tor, primarily, um, he was my editor, a fellow named Greg Cox. Greg writes Star Trek novels. He's been doing it for a long time. He does lots of intellectual, intellectual property novels. Uh, he's done Superman, Batman. Um, he got to do a series on the TV show Leverage. And I loved working with Greg. We did not always see eye to eye on everything, but I was always treated respectfully when we didn't see eye to eye. And he always was good about, you know, there were some things where he's like, no, we don't need this. And I had had such a respectful experience with him for seven books. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, for seven novels. Um, that I trusted his judgment and uh, that we didn't always see eye to eye. And a couple of times he wanted to cut something and I would be like, no, 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 no. I want to keep it. And he would be like, okay. But if he thought it was something that was like a hole in the plot or causing some kind of uh, chaos in the novel, he would be, you know, pretty you know, straightforward about it. And he would be like, uh, we really need to change this. Um, and like I said, I never felt like I was forced into a corner with Greg. Um, I look forward to the next time I get to work with him. I hope I get to work with him again soon because he's a fantastic person. He's a great human being. Um, we love a lot of the same kind of stuff. We're kind of children of the same generation to a degree. And um, I love working with him. He's a great editor and a, a tremendous professional. So that was a good experience. The folks I've worked with at Titan when I was doing the uh, Men in Black book, uh, my editor there, Sam, Sam, I am, oh my God, I'm sorry, Sam, I'm, I'm having a stroke, don't blame me, please, uh, maybe it's in the acknowledgments, 
Sam Matthews. Sam Matthews. I enjoyed working with Sam immensely. We were in different time zones. We were under a lot of pressure for getting the book out around the time of the movie. And there were numerous changes to the script that had to be reflected in the novel. Uh, Sam was always a pleasure to work with and treated me very professionally. And when I had strayed from the uh, canon a bit or I had strayed from the script, uh, Sam went to bat, with, bat for me with Sony to see which of those changes they would keep. So I got to actually add a little, little few little th you know, odds and ends to the Men in Black canon because of my editor being awesome. I hope, I, I hope I get to work with Sam again sometime soon. That would be wonderful. So when I was doing magazine work way back before uh, Six Gun Tarot, even before the Star Trek book. Um, oh, and a funny Star Trek story really quick. Uh, uh, Elisa Kaysen, the editor for the Star Trek uh, anthology that was kind of like my first big story to, to do. Elisa contacted me. She'd sent me the galley proofs in the mail because that's how we did it back then. And um, I was looking at the galley proofs and she called me up and she was just tiptoeing around like she was in a minefield or something. And she's like, so everything's okay? I said, yeah, it looks great. And she's like, okay, you sure? Um, we try really hard not to change any of the, the wording or anything like that unless we absolutely have to. And I'm like, it's okay. And it turned out, you know, eventually what kind of I discovered was that you know some some writers are really picky and touchy about what you do to their work and i'm like look i <laughs> i write for like six different editors right now all of them have different rules do's and don'ts um i don't really have time to get terribly offended i mean i'll i'll, I'll you back me into a corner on something i feel strongly about then yeah we'll have a tussle but no this is fine this is great and i'm also thinking to myself these are like first time writers these are like people who are just getting their like first big break and you're going to sit there and be like, don't you dare touch that comma. That is a sacred comma. You know, come on. Um, again, back to the premise that I have learned the hard way uh, through experience. Your editors are there to help you. Trust your editor. Like I said, nine times out of 10, you're not going to go wrong. So back when I was doing you know, magazine work, pre-Star Trek, pre all of this. Um, I did have one editor that just, I apparently rubbed her entirely the wrong way. And she did the same to me. I had been a freelancer working with her uh, prior to us working together again. And she just seemed to enjoy nitpicking my stories. And again, maybe they needed the nitpicking but I, I didn't see that much value in the changes that she was making. And that is something else. You know, you're not always going to get along with every person you work with. And um, I, I you know, tried to be cool and just let her change the things she wanted to change. Um, she would get kind of critique -y and uh, abusive in her editing. Um, and that's really where our, where our problems kind of started because if we're talking about, you know, the flow of the sentence is wrong or um, uh, you didn't get this information, that's one thing, but um, she would kind of critique after the fact. She'd ask for one thing and then complain when she didn't get it after the fact. So we didn't get along well. And then we discovered that uh, the publisher I was working for and had been doing a lot of editorial stuff with uh, put me as assistant publisher, assistant editor, to her on a magazine that she had worked on for a long time and kind of considered her baby. Uh, however, the person who owned it had went ahead and sold it to someone else and now it was their baby. And she and I knocked heads quite a bit and it was not overall a, a generally pleasant uh, experience for either one of us. Um, but we got through it and we got the publication out and I feel very proud about the work we did. So. Would I like to work for her again? No, 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 no. A thousand times no. Um, I don't even know. She may be retired by now. I don't have a clue. But those are the kinds of things you can bump into. Last story I'm going to give you, and then I'm going to get out of here. I have an eye appointment I need to take off to. Um, oh, 
and it's something I also want to mention to you about something on the horizon. But first, last story. Uh, I was doing a cover story for Virginia Business. I think I've told you this one before, but it's, it, it bears on the subject of edit, you know, working with editors. Um, it was a cover story. It was a lot of dough. It was kind of exciting to be working on this. Dealing with how NASCAR um, was part of like the Commonwealth of Virginia's economic, uh, the engine of the, of the economy for Virginia. Gotcha. Um, so it was, a, anyway, I worked on it for a couple months and, um, wrote it up. I got to talk to the governor at the time, which pinhead was it? I don't remember. They're all pinheads. Um, but, uh, talked to the governor, talked to some folks from NASA, talked to some NASCAR people, talked to some people who, um, are involved with the track up in Martinsville, Virginia. And um, it was a good story. I was, I was pretty happy with it. I thought it was pretty inclusive and incisive because, <clears throat> of course, I wrote it. And I sent it off to my editor. His name was Robert Smith. Not the guy from The Cure, I, though I do like to sometimes imagine him sitting there behind the keyboard with the hair and all in black, looking kind of like Edward Scissorhands, Ed, Edward keyboard, hand, keyboard Hands. And um, <clears throat> I sent it off to Robert, who was an awesome guy, great editor, great editor. Um, so I uh, sent it off to him, and it comes back in an envelope a week later, soaked in blood. <laughs> so much red ink, so much red ink. And I was pissed, because I put in several months of my life on this thing and ran all over the place. I thought it was a pretty damn good story. He had me moving paragraphs around. He had me killing parts of paragraphs and moving other parts of paragraphs around. He would, he would circle things like the, and, and it would just be, and with a question mark. You know, I remember that. It was like the, and it was part of the beginning of a sentence, question mark. And I'm like, what do I do with that? So got pissed, sitting there in front of my keyboard, and here's a tip for all you Twitter cats and kittens. If you find yourself in this situation, if someone writes something that you don't like or don't agree with, maybe you could try this out. I started to write him a nasty email and then I stopped. And I calmed the fuck down. And I said, okay, I'm getting paid for this story. I am a contractor. This is the person I'm contracting to. They did not like the way I had the story they marked it up and moved things around. And I'm gonna do every single thing they asked me to do. Being poor can sometimes help you to not make stupid decisions. <laughs> so I needed the money and I, I you know, wanted more work from this publication. <clears throat> and all the time I'd worked with Robert prior to this had been fine. So this was probably the biggest piece of work I had done for them. And maybe that's why I got a little butthurt about it. But I took, I made every change. I made every correction. I moved everything around. I deleted the things they wanted to delete it. I, I ignored the V circled question mark because I didn't know what the fuck he wanted there. <clears throat> Sorry, Robert, if you're hearing this, just the truth. Hope you're well. I know you just retired recently. And um, I hope you're enjoying it. And you were a bomb ass editor to work with look that up <clears throat> so anyways um i finish it i make all the edits i make all the corrections i read the story it is a thousand times better it was fucking perfect and it was beautiful because he hadn't really unlike this other editor that i have issues with it wasn't a matter of deleting the information that i was giving it was more about formatting that information in a way that was the most effective and the most uh, uh, pleasing to the reader. So it wasn't like he was dissing me. It wasn't like he was rewriting me. He was just rearranging the furniture. So when someone walked in the door, they went, oh, I love your place. That's all he was doing. And that was like an epiphany moment for me because I'd been so pissed off about it. But I didn't uh, let my emotions get the better of me for once. Twitter people. And I, uh, 
I just kind of chilled and did my job. And I had a much better article. I looked so much better as the writer of that article after my editor had had a little chance to massage it a little. So you are going to have times when you're going to have to stand up for yourself with your editor, maybe your publisher. You're going to have times when you're going to have to bite the bullet, cowboy up, and let them do their job and respect them that they know what they're doing. So I don't know if that really is a lot of help to you, but I hope it at least gives you some perspective on what you can expect as you move further down the line of professional writing. Your editor is your ally and your editor, if they're a good editor, if they are good at their craft, they want what you want, which is to present the best possible story, novel, news article, whatever it is, to the reader that you possibly can. So here in, in this, the lesson, <laughs> all right, I got to roll in just a second. But first, I am setting up a couple of new YouTube channels, and I think I'm setting up a podcast. How's he do it? I don't know. I haven't done it yet. Um, I'm going to do one. I think I'm calling it Serial Thrillers, <laughs> um, which is going to be me reading uh, unpublished work of mine. Uh, I've got several novels that I have started on, haven't finished for various reasons. And um, I'm going to start out doing like a chapter per Per, per video. It's going to be all audio. I'm going to have like a nice little visual graphic. I hope, I hope. I'm kind of crossing my fingers there. But uh, Serial Thrillers is going to basically be uh, a way for me to get more content out to you wonderful people. And hopefully uh, you will. Uh, I'll, I'll let you know when it launches. I'll send you the links to it and everything else. <clears throat> and uh, I'm also uh, trying to get a YouTube channel going, which is going to be the um, and, you know, basically the, the recordings of the D and D adventure campaign that I am doing for my Patreon people, which is called the One Hundred Leagues. And um, we've had a lot of trouble with the technology here, <laughs> but bad no. I think we got it kind of squared away and I'm looking forward to getting the first, it will actually be the second session out to you. The first session, the recording didn't go so well. So what I'm probably going to do is do like session one is going to be a video with me kind of explaining what's going on with the world, what happened with the characters in the first session, and then picking up with the recording on the second session. So fingers crossed on that. And hopefully we'll get lots of people interested in that too. I'm also thinking of using uh, doing a podcast for the serial thrillers stuff, so it's also going to be available just, just purely as a, as a podcast. And I'm thinking about doing a podcast or maybe a YouTube channel with my buddy Dave. Um, he has been foolish enough to say he'd be interested in that. And one of the things we're kicking around is maybe doing a, uh, a channel about uh, the crossroads between film and TV and gaming. So we might do something with that. Or we might not. I don't know. And I also am kicking around, and again, a lot of this stuff may never see fruition because, you know. Um, but I also run a Chronicles of Amber game for a lot of folks. And I love Rogers and Lasney, and I love the Chronicles of Amber. It's one of my favorite series. It had a huge impact on me as a writer. And I might try to see if I can do um, a video uh, channel for YouTube talking about the Chronicles of Amber and the game I run but also talking about it, you know, purely from a literary standpoint, because I think it's one of the greatest works of fantasy of all time. I would put it right up there with uh, Lord of the Rings. Go at it. Be careful, Lord of the Rings. Chronicles of Amber cheats hard. They do. So uh, anyways, thank you guys for listening to my ramblings. I hope you enjoyed it you did, please subscribe. Please share the video. Uh, click on the little bell to, uh, for notifications for when more stuff like this is coming out. Share the videos for me, please, if you think they're of value or merit. 
because grandbaby got to go to college because she's a genius and she's two months old and she's trying to push herself up and she's trying to talk and she's bored. <laughs> so grandpa got to get that cheddar together to get her into college because she's probably going to be going to college at like 16 or something is what I'm thinking if, if this trend holds. Anyways, great to talk to you guys. Got to run, get my peepers checked out. I'll tell you all about that thrilling story. Um, have a great day and I'll catch you on the next video. Take care. Bye.